Yes, because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs since the City Arms Hotel, when he used to be pretending to be laid up with a sick voice, doing his highness, to make himself interesting for that old faggot Mrs Reardon, that he thought he had a great leg off. And she never left us a farthing, all for masses for herself and her soul, greatest miser ever was, actually afraid to lay out four pence for her methylated spirit, telling me all her ailments. She had too much old chat in her about politics and earthquakes and the end of the world. Let us have a bit of fun first. God help the world if all the women were her sort, down on bathing suits and low necks. Of course nobody wanted her to wear them. I suppose she was pious, because no man would look at her twice. I hope I'll never be like her. I wonder she didn't want us to cover our faces. But she was a well-educated woman, certainly, and her gabby talk about Mr. Reardon here and Mr. Reardon there. I suppose he was glad to get shut of her. And her dog, smelling my fur, and always edging to get up under my petticoats, especially then. Still, I like that in him. Polite to old women like that, and waiters, and beggars too. He's not proud out of nothing, but not always. If ever he got anything really serious the matter with him, it's much better for them to go into a hospital where everything is clean, but I suppose I'd have to drink it in to him for a month, yes. And then we'd have a hospital nurse next thing on the carpet, have him stay in there till they throw him out, or a nun, maybe, <laughs> like the smutty photo he has. She's as much a nun as I'm not. Yes, because they're so weak and pulling when they're sick. They want a woman to get well. If his nose bleeds, you'd think it was, oh, tragic, and that dying-looking one off the South Circular when he sprained his foot at the choir party at the Sugarloaf Mountain. The day I wore that dress. Miss Stack bringing him flowers, the worst old one she could find at the bottom of the basket. Anything at all to get into a man's bedroom with her old maid's voice. Trying to imagine he was dying on account of her. To never see thy face again. Though he looked more like a man with his beard a bit grown in the bed. Father was the same. Besides, I hate bandaging and dosing. When he cut his toe with the razor, paring his corns, afraid he'd get blood poisoning. But if it was a thing I was sick, then we'd see what attention. Only, of course, the woman hides it. Not to give all the trouble. They do. Yes, he came somewhere. I'm sure by his appetite. Anyway, love it's not, or he'd be off his feed thinking of her. So either it was one of those night women, if it was down there, he was, really. And the hotel story, he made up a pack of lies to hide it, planning it. Hines kept me. Who did I meet? Ah, yes, I met. Do you remember Menton? And who else? Let me see. That big babby face. I saw him. And he not long married, flirting with a young girl at Poole's Myriama, and turned my back on him when he slinked out, looking quite conscious. What harm. But he had the impudence to make up to me one time. Well done to him, mouth almighty, and his boiled eyes. Of all the big stupos I ever met, and that's called a solicitor. Only for I hate having a long wrangle in bed. Or else if it's not that, it's some little bitch or other he got in with somewhere or picked up on the sly. If they only knew him as well as I do. Yes, because the day before yesterday he was scribbling something. A letter. When I came into the front room to show him Dignam's death in the paper as if something told me. And he covered it up with the blotting paper, pretending to be thinking about business. 
So very probably that was it. To somebody who thinks she has a softy in him. Because all men get a bit like that, at his age especially. Getting on to forty he is now. So as to wheedle any money she can out of him. No fool like an old fool. And then the usual kissing my bottom was to hide it. Not that I care two straws now who he does it with, or knew before that way. Though I'd like to find out. So long as I don't have the two of them under my nose all the time. Like that slush, that Mary we had in Ontario Terrace, padding out her false bottom to excite him. Bad enough to get the smell of those painted women off him. Once or twice I had a suspicion by getting him to come near me when I found the long hair on his coat. Without that one, when I went into the kitchen, pretending he was drinking water. One woman is not enough for them. It was all his fault, of course, ruining servants. Then proposing that she could eat at our table on Christmas Day, if you please. Oh, no, thank you. Not in my house. Stealing my potatoes and the oysters, two and six per dozen. Going out to see her aunt, if you please. Common robbery, so it was. But I was sure he had something on with that one. It takes me to find out a thing like that. He said, you have no proof it was her. Proof? Oh, yes. Her aunt was very fond of oysters. But I told her what I thought of her suggesting me to go out, to be alone with her. I wouldn't lower myself to spy on them. The garters I found in her room the Friday she was out. That was enough for me, a little bit too much. Her face swelled up on her with temper when I gave her her week's notice. I saw to that. Better do without them altogether, do out the rooms myself quicker, only for the damn cooking and throwing out the dirt. I gave it to him anyhow. Either she or me leaves the house. I couldn't even touch him if I thought he was with a dirty, barefaced liar and sloven like that one, denying it up to my face and singing about the place in the WC too, because she knew she was too well off. Yes, because he couldn't possibly do without it that long, so he must do it somewhere. And the last time he came on my bottom. When was it? The night Boylan gave my hand a great squeeze. Going along by the tolka. In my hand there steals another. I just pressed the back of his like that. With my thumb to squeeze back. Singing the young May moon she's beaming love. Because he has an idea about him and me. He's not such a fool. He said, I'm dining out and going to the gaiety. Though I'm not going to give him the satisfaction in any case. God knows he's a change, in a way. Not to be always and ever wearing the same old hat. Unless I paid some nice looking boy to do it. Since I can't do it myself. A young boy would like me. I'd confuse him a little. Alone with him. If we were, I'd let him see my garters, the new one, and make him turn red looking at him, seduce him. I know what boys feel, with that down on their cheek, doing that friggin', drawing out the thing by the hour, question and answer. Would you do this, that and the other, with the coalman? Yes. With the bishop? Yes, I would because I told them about some dean or bishop was sitting beside me in the Jews' temple's gardens. And I was knitting that woolen thing. A stranger to Dublin. What place was it? And so on about the monuments. And he tired me out with statues, encouraging him, making him worse than he is. Who is in your mind now? Tell me. Who are you thinking of? Who is it? Tell me his name. Who? Tell me who. The German emperor, is it? Yes. Imagine I'm him. Think of him. Can you feel him? Trying to make a whore of me. What he never will. He ought to give it up now at this age of his life. Simply ruination for any woman. And no satisfaction in it. 
pretending to like it till he comes, and then finish it off myself anyway. And it makes your lips pale. Anyhow, it's done now once and for all, with all the talk of the world about it people make. It's only the first time. After that, it's just the ordinary. Do it and think no more about it. Why can't you kiss a man without going and marrying him first? You sometimes love to, wildly. When you feel that way so nice all over you, you can't help yourself. I wish some man or other would take me some time when he's there and kiss me in his arms. There's nothing like a kiss, long and hot down to your soul. Almost paralyzes you. Then I hate that confession. When I used to go to Father Corrigan, he touched me father. And what harm if he did? Where? And I said on the canal bank, like a fool. But whereabouts on your person, my child? On the lake behind. High up, was it? Yes, rather high up. Was it where you sit down? Yes. Oh, Lord. Couldn't he say bottom right out and have done with it? What has that got to do with it? And did you? Whatever way he put it, I forget. No, father. And I always think of the real father. What did he want to know for when I already confessed it to God? He had a nice, fat hand. The palm moist always. I wouldn't mind feeling it. Neither would he, I'd say, by the bull neck in his horse collar. I wonder, did he know me in the box? I could see his face. He couldn't see mine. Of course, he'd never turn or let on. Still, his eyes were red when his father died. They're lost for a woman, of course. Must be terrible when a man cries, let alone them. I'd like to be embraced by one in his vestments, and the smell of incense off him like the Pope. Besides, there's no danger with the priest if you're married. He's too careful about himself. Then gives something to his holiness the Pope for a penance. I wonder, was he satisfied with me? One thing I didn't like, his slapping me behind going away so familiarly in the hall. Though I laughed. I'm not a horse. Or an ass, am I? I suppose he was thinking of his father. I wonder, is he awake? Thinking of me? Or dreaming? Am I in it? Who gave him that flower he said he bought? He smelled of some kind of drink. Not whiskey or stout, or perhaps the sweety kind of paste they stick their bills up with. Some liquor. I'd like to sip those rich-looking green and yellow expensive drinks those stage-door Johnnies drink with the opera hats. I tasted once with my finger, dipped out of that American that had the squirrel, talk and stance with father. He had all he could do to keep himself from falling asleep after the last time. After we took the porch and potted meat, it had a fine, salty taste. Yes, because I felt lovely and tired myself and fell asleep as sound as a top the moment I popped straight into bed. Till that thunder woke me up. God be merciful to us. I thought the heavens were coming down about us to punish us when I blessed myself and said a Hail Mary, like those awful thunderbolts in Gibraltar as if the world was coming to an end. And then they come to you and tell you there's no God. What could you do if it was? Running and rushing about, nothing. Only make an act of contrition. The candle I lit that evening in Whitefriar Street Chapel for the month of May, see, it brought its luck. Though he'd scoff if he heard, because he never goes to church, mass or meeting. He says, your soul... You have no soul inside, only grey matter. Because he doesn't know what it is to have one. Yes, when I lit the lamp, 
because he must have come three or four times with that tremendous big red brute of a thing he has. I thought the vein, or whatever the dickens they call it, was going to burst, though his nose is not so big, after I took off all my things, with the blinds down, after my hours dressing and perfuming and combing it like iron or some kind of a thick crowbar standing all the time. He must have eaten oysters. I think a few dozen. He was in great singing voice. No, I never in all my life felt anyone had won the size of that to make you feel full up. He must have eaten a whole sheep after. What's the idea, making us like that with a big hole in the middle of us? Or like a stallion, driving it up into you? Because that's all they want out of you. With that determined, vicious look in his eye, I had to half shut my eyes. Still, he hasn't such a tremendous amount of spunk in him when I made him pull out and do it on me, considering how big it is. So much the better, in case any of it wasn't washed out properly. The last time, I let him finish it in me. Nice invention they made for women, for him to get all the pleasure. But if someone gave them a touch of it themselves, they'd know what I went through with Millie. Nobody would believe, cutting her teeth too. And Minna Purefoy's husband. Give us a swing out of your whiskers, filling her up with a child or twins once a year, as regular as the clock, always with the smell of children off her. The one they call budges or something, like a nigger with a shock of hair on it. Jesus, Jack, that child is a black. The last time I was there, a squad of them falling over one another and bawling, you couldn't hear your ears. Supposed to be healthy. Not satisfied till they have us swollen out like elephants. Or I don't know what. Supposing I risked having another. Not of him, though. Still, if he was married... I'm sure he'd have a fine, strong child. But I'd know. Poldy has more spunk in him. Yes. That'd be awfully jolly. I suppose it was meeting Josie Powell and the funeral and thinking about me and Boylan set him off. Well, he can think what he likes now if that'll do him any good. I know they were spooning a bit when I came on the scene. He was dancing and sitting out with her the night of Georgina Simpson's housewarming. And then he wanted to ram it down my neck. It was on account of not liking to see her a wallflower. That was why we had the stand-up row over politics. He began it, not me. When he said about our Lord being a carpenter, at last he made me cry. Of course, a woman is so sensitive about everything. I was fuming with myself after for giving in. Only for I knew he was gone on me. And the first socialist he said he was. He annoyed me so much. I couldn't put him into a temper. Still, he knows a lot of mixed up things. Especially about the body. And the inside. I often wanted to study up that myself. What we have inside us in that family physician. I could always hear his voice talking when the room was crowded and watch him. After that, I pretended I had a coolness on with her over him because he used to be a bit on the jealous side whenever he asked, Who are you going to? And I said over to Floey and he made me the present of Lord Byron's poems and the three pairs of gloves so that finished that. I could quite easily get him to make it up any time. I know how I'd, even supposing he got in with her again and was going out to see her somewhere. I'd just go to her and ask her, do you love him? And look her square in the eyes. She couldn't fool me. But he might imagine he was and make a declaration to her with his plabbery kind of manner like he did to me. 
though I had the devil's own job to get it out of him. Though I liked him for that, it showed he could hold in and wasn't to be got for the asking. He was on the pop of asking me too the night in the kitchen I was rolling the potato cake. There's something I want to say to you. Only for I put him off, letting on I was in a temper, with my hands and arms full of pasty flour. In any case, I let out too much the night before, talking of dreams, so I didn't want to let him know more than was good for him. She used to be always embracing me, chosy whenever he was there, meaning him, of course, glomming me over. And when I said, I washed up and down as far as possible, asking me, And did you wash possible? The women are always egging on to that, putting it on thick when he's there. They know by his sly eye, blinking a bit, putting on the indifferent when they come out with something, the kind he is, what spoils him. I don't wonder in the least, because he was very handsome at that time, trying to look like Lord Byron, I said I liked, though he was too beautiful for a man, and he was a little, before we got engaged. Afterwards, though, she didn't like it so much. The day I was in fits of laughing with the giggles, I couldn't stop about all my hairpins falling out one after another with the massive hair I had. You're always in great humour, she said. Yes, because it gricked her, because she knew what it meant, because I used to tell her a good bit of what went on between us. Not all but just enough to make her mouth water. But that wasn't my fault. She didn't darken the door much after we were married. I wonder what she's got like now, after living with that dotty husband of hers she had, her face beginning to look drawn and run down the last time I saw her. She must have been just after a row with him, because I saw on the moment she was edging to draw down a conversation about husbands, and talk about him, to run him down. What was it she told me? Oh, yes, that sometimes he used to go to bed with his muddy boots on when the maggot takes him. Just imagine having to get into bed with a thing like that, that might murder you any moment. What a man! Well, it's not the one way everyone goes mad. Poldy, anyhow. Whatever he does always wipes his feet on the mat when he comes in, wet or shine, and always blacks his own boots too, and he always takes off his hat when he comes up in the street, like then. And now he's going about in his slippers to look for £10,000 for a postcard. You pee up, oh sweetheart, May. Wouldn't a thing like that simply bore you stiff to extinction? Actually, too stupid even to take his boots off. Now, what could you make of a man like that? I'd rather die twenty times over than marry another of their sex. Of course, he'd never find another woman like me to push up with him the way I do, know me, come sleep with me. Yes, and he knows that too at the bottom of his heart. Take that Mrs. Maybrick that poisoned her husband. For what, I wonder? In love with some other man. Yes. It was found out on her. Wasn't she the downright villain to go and do a thing like that? Of course, some men can be dreadfully aggravating. Drive you mad. And always the worst word in the world. What do they ask us to marry them for if we're so bad as all that comes to? Yes. Because they can't get on without us. White arsenic she put in his tea. Off fly paper, wasn't it? I wonder why they call it that. If I asked him, he'd say, it's from the Greek. Leave us as wise as we were before. She must have been madly in love with the other fella to run the chance of being hanged. Oh, she didn't care. If that was her nature, what could she do? Besides, they're not brutes enough to go and hang a woman, surely, are they? They're all so different. Boylan, 
talking about the shape of my foot, he noticed at once even before he was introduced, when I was in the DBC with Poldy, laughing and trying to listen. I was waggling my foot. We both ordered two teas and plain bread and butter. I saw him looking with his two old maids of sisters when I stood up and asked the girl where it was. What do I care? With it dropping out of me and that black closed breeches he made me buy takes you half an hour to let them down, wetting all myself, always with some brand new fad every other week. Such a long one I did. I forgot my suede gloves on the seat behind that I never got after some robber of a woman and he wanted me to put it in the Irish Times, lost in the ladies' lavatory, DBC Dame Street, find a return to Mrs. Marion Bloom. And I saw his eyes on my feet, going out through the turn and door. He was looking when I looked back, and I went there for tea two days after in the hope but he wasn't. Now, how did that excite him? Because I was crossing them when we were in the other room first. He meant the shoes that are too tight to walk in. My hand is nice like that. If I only had a ring with the stone for my month, a nice aquamarine. I'll stick him for one. And a gold bracelet. I don't like my foot so much. Still, I made him spend once with my foot the night after Goodwin's botch-up of a concert. So cold and windy it was. Well, we had that rum in the house to mull. And the fire wasn't black out when he asked to take off my stockings lying on the hearth rug in Lombard Street West. And another time, it was my muddy boots. He'd like me to walk in all the horse's dung I could find. But of course, he's not natural like the rest of the world that I... What did he say? I could give nine points and ten to Catty Lanner and beat her. What does that mean? I asked him. I forget what he said because the stop press edition just passed and the man with the curly hair in the Luke and Derry that's so polite. I think I saw his face before somewhere. I noticed him when I was tasting the butter, so I took my time. Bartell Darcy, too, that he used to make fun of when he commenced kissing me on the choir stairs after I sang Guno's Ave Maria. What are we waiting for, oh my heart? Kiss me straight on the brow and part. Which is my brown part he was pretty hot for. All his tinny voice, too. My low notes. He was always raving about, if you can believe him. I liked the way he used his mouth, singing. Then he said... Wasn't it terrible to do that there in a place like that? I don't see anything so terrible about it. I'll tell him about that some day, not now, and surprise him. Aye, and I'll take him there and show him the very place too we did it. So now, there you are, like it or lump it. He thinks nothing can happen without him knowing. He hadn't an idea about my mother till we were engaged. Otherwise, he'd never have got me so cheap as he did. He was ten times worse himself, anyhow. Begging me to give him a tiny bit, cut off my drawers. That was the evening, coming along Kenilworth Square. He kissed me in the eye of my glove, and I had to take it off, asking me questions. Is it permitted to inquire the shape of my bedroom? So I let him keep it, as if I forgot it to think of me when I saw him slip it into his pocket. Of course, he's mad on the subject of drawers that's plain to be seen. Always skeezing at those brazen-faced things on the bicycles, 
with their skirts blown up to their navels. Even when Millie and I were out with them at the open-air fete, that one in the cream muslin standing right against the sun so he could see every atom she had on. When he saw me from behind, following in the rain. I saw him before he saw me, however, standing at the corner of the Harold's Cross Road with a new raincoat on him, with the muffler in the zingery colours to show off his complexion and the brown hat looking sly boots as usual. What was he doing there, where he'd no business? They can go and get whatever they like from anything at all with a skirt on it, and we're not to ask any questions. But they want to know, where were you? Where are you going? I could feel him, coming along, skulking after me, his eyes on my neck. He had been keeping away from the house, he felt it was getting too warm for him, so I half turned and stopped. Then he pestered me to say yes, till I took off my glove, slowly watching him. He said my openwork sleeves were too cold for the rain. Anything for an excuse to put his hand near me. Drawers, drawers, the whole blessed time, till I promised to give him the pair off my doll to carry about in his waistcoat pocket. Oh, Maria Santa Sima, he did look a big fool, dreeping in the rain. Splendid set of teeth he had, made me hungry to look at them, and beseeched me to lift the orange petticoat I had on, with the sunray pleats, that there was nobody. He said he'd kneel down in the wet if I didn't. So persevering he would, too, and ruin his new raincoat. You never know what freak they'd take alone with you. They're so savage for it. If anyone was passing. So I lifted them a bit and touched his trousers outside. The way I used to garden her after with my ring hand. To keep him from doing worse where it was too public. I was dying to find out was he circumcised. He was shaking like a jelly all over. They want to do everything too quick, take all the pleasure out of it, and father waiting all the time for his dinner. He told me to say I left my purse in the butcher's and had to go back for it. What a deceiver! Then he wrote me that letter, with all those words in it. How could he have the face to any woman after his company manners, making it so awkward after when we met? Asking me, have I offended you? With my eyelids down, of course he saw I wasn't. He had a few brains, not like that other fool, Henny Doyle. He was always breaking or tearing something in the charades. I hate an unlucky man. And if I knew what it meant, of course I had to say no, for form's sake. Don't understand you, I said. And wasn't it natural? So it is, of course. It used to be written up with the picture of a woman's on that wall in Gibraltar, with that word I couldn't find anywhere. Only for children seeing it too young. Then writing every morning a letter, sometimes twice a day. I liked the way he made love then. He knew the way to take a woman. When he sent me the eight big poppies, because mine was the eighth. Then I wrote, the night he kissed my heart at Dolphin's Barn. I couldn't describe it. Simply it makes you feel like nothing on earth. But he never knew how to embrace well, like Gardner. I hope you'll come on Monday, as he said, at the same time, for I hate people who come at all hours, and the door, you think it's the vegetables, then it's somebody and you all undressed, or the door of the filthy sloppy kitchen blows open. The day, oh, frosty face Goodwin called about the concert in Lombard Street, and I just after dinner, all flushed and tossed with boiling old stew. Don't look at me, Professor, I had to say. I'm a fright. Yes, but he was a real old gent in his way. 
It was impossible to be more respectful. Nobody to say you're out. You have to peep out through the blind. Like the messenger boy today, I thought it was a put-off first, him sending the port and the peaches first. And I was just beginning to yawn with nerves, thinking he was trying to make a fool of me, when I knew his tat tat at the door. <clears throat> he must have been a bit late, because it was quarter after three when I saw the two deadless girls coming from school. I never know the time. Even that watch he gave me never seems to go properly. I'd want to get it looked after. When I threw the penny to that lame sailor for England home and beauty, when I was whistling, There is a charming girl I love. And I hadn't even put on my clean shift or powdered myself or a thing. Then this day week we're to go to Belfast. Just as well he has to go to Ennis, his father's anniversary, the 27th. It wouldn't be pleasant if he did. Suppose our rooms at the hotel were beside each other and any fool and went on in the new bed. I couldn't tell him to stop and not bother me with him in the next room or perhaps some Protestant clergyman with a cough knocking on the wall. Then he'd never believe the next day we didn't do something. It's all very well a husband, but you can't fool a lover. After me telling him we never did anything. Of course he didn't believe me. No. It's better he's going where he is. Besides, something always happens with him. The time going to the mellow concert at Maryborough, ordering boiling soup for the two of us. Then the bell rang out. He walks down the platform with the soup splashing about, taking spoonfuls of it. Hadn't he the nerve? And the waiter after him, making a holy show of us, screeching and confusion for the engine to start, but he wouldn't pay till he finished it. The two gentlemen in the third-class carriage said he was quite right. So he was, too. He's so pig-headed sometimes when he gets a thing into his head. A good job he was able to open the carriage door with his knife, or they'd have taken us on to Cork. I suppose that was done out of revenge on him. Oh, I love chanting in a train or a car with lovely soft cushions. I wonder, will he take a first class for me? He might want to do it in the train by tipping the guard. Well, oh, I suppose that'll be the usual idiots of men gaping at us with their eyes as stupid as ever they can possibly be. That was an exceptional man, that common workman, that left us alone in the carriage that day going to Howth. I'd like to find out something about him, one or two tunnels, perhaps. Then you have to look out of the window, all the nicer than coming back. Suppose I never came back. What would they say? eloped with him. That gets you on on the stage. The last concert I sang at. Where? It's over a year ago. When was it? St. Teresa's Hall, Clarendon Street. Little chits of missies they have now singing. Kathleen Kearney and her like. On account of father being in the army and my singing the absent-minded beggar and wearing a brooch for Lord Roberts, when I had the map of it all, and Poldy not Irish enough. Was it him managed it this time? I wouldn't put it past him, like he got me on to sing in the stabbit matter by going around saying he was putting lead kindly light to music. I put him up to that till the Jesuits found out he was a Freemason, thumping the piano, lead thou me on, copied from some old opera. <laughs> yes, and he was going about with some of them Sinner Fane lately, or whatever they call themselves, talking as usual trash and nonsense. He says that little man he showed me without the neck is very intelligent. The common man, Griffiths. Is he?
Well, he doesn't look it. That's all I can say. Still, it must have been him. He knew there was a boycott. I hate the mention of their politics. After the war. That Pretoria and Ladysmith and Bloemfontein. Where Gardner, Lieutenant Stanley G, 8th Battalion, 2nd East Lancashire Regiment of Enteric Fever. He was a lovely fella in khaki and just the right height over me. I'm sure he was brave too. He said I was lovely. The evening we kissed goodbye at the canal lock. My Irish beauty. He was pale with excitement about going away or we'd be seen from the road. He couldn't stand properly. And I so hot as I never felt. They could have made their peace in the beginning or old Oom Paul and the rest of the other old Krugers go and fight it out between them instead of dragging on for years, killing any fine-looking men there were with their fever. If he was even decently shot, it wouldn't have been so bad. I love to see a regiment pass and review. The first time I saw the Spanish cavalry at La Roque, it was lovely after, looking across the bay from Algeciras, all the lights of the rock like fireflies, or those sham battles on the Fifteen Acres, the Black Watch with their kilts in time at the march, past the Tenth Hussars, the Prince of Wales' own, or the Lancers, oh, the Lancers, they're grand, or the Dublins that won Tugela. His father made his money over selling the horses for the cavalry. Well, he could buy me a nice present up in Belfast after what I gave him. They've lovely linen up there, or one of those nice kimono things. I must buy a mothball like I had before to keep in the drawer with them. It would be exciting, going round with them, shopping, buying those things in a new city. Better leave this ring behind. Want to keep turning and turning to get it over the knuckle. There. Or they might bell it round the town in their papers. Or tell the police on me. But they'd think we're married. Oh, let them all go and smother themselves for the fat lot I care. He has plenty of money and he's not a marrying man, so somebody better get it out of him. If I could find out whether he likes me. I looked a bit washy, of course, when I looked close in the hand glass powdering. A mirror never gives you the expression. Besides... Scrooching down on me like that all the time with his big hip bones. He's heavy too with his hairy chest for this heat. Always having to lie down for them. Better for him put it into me from behind the way Mrs. Mastiansky told me her husband made her, like the dogs do it, and stick out her tongue as far as ever she could. And he's so quiet and mild with his tin-gating sither. Can you ever be up to men the way it takes them? <clears throat> Lovely stuff in that blue suit he had on and stylish tie and socks with the sky blue silk things on them. He's certainly well off. I know by the cut his clothes have and his heavy watch. But he was like a perfect devil for a few minutes after he came back with the stop press, tearing up the tickets and swearing blazes because he lost 20 quid. He said he lost over that outsider, that one, and half he put on for me, on account of Lenehan's tip, cursing him to the lowest pits. That sponger. He was making free with me after the Glen Cree dinner, coming back that long jolt over the Featherbed Mountain after the Lord Mayor looking at me with his dirty eyes. Val Dillon, that big heathen. I first noticed him at dessert, when I was cracking the nuts with my teeth. 
I wish I could have picked every morsel of that chicken out of my fingers. It was so tasty and browned and as tender as anything. Only for I didn't want to eat everything on my plate. Those forks and fish slices were hallmark silver too. I wish I had some. I could easily have slipped a couple into my muff when I was playing with them. Always hanging out of them for money in a restaurant for the bit you put down your throat. We have to be thankful for our mangy cup of tea itself as a great compliment to be noticed the way the world is divided. In any case, if it's going to go on, I want at least two other good chemises for one thing and... But I don't know what kind of drawers he likes. None at all, I think. Didn't he say? Yes. And half the girls in Gibraltar never wore them either, naked as God made them. That Andalusian singing her Manola. She didn't make much secret of what she hadn't. Yes. And the second pair of silkette stockings is laddered after one day's wear. I could have brought them back to Lures this morning and kick up a row and made that one change them, only not to upset myself and run the risk of walking into him and ruining the whole thing. And one of those kid fitting corsets I'd want, advertised cheap in the gentlewoman with elastic gores on the hips. He saved the one I have, but that's no good. What did they say? They give a delightful figure line, eleven and six, obviating that unsightly broad appearance across the lower back to reduce flesh. My belly is a bit too big. I'll have to knock off the stout at dinner, or am I getting too fond of it? The last they sent from O'Rourke's was as flat as a pancake. He makes his money easy. Larry, they call him. The old mangy parcel he sent at Christmas. A cottage cake and a bottle of hogwash he tried to pam off as claret that he couldn't get anyone to drink. God spare his spit for fear he'd die of the drought. Or I must do a few breathing exercises. I wonder is that anti-fat any good? Might overdo it. The thin ones are not so much the fashion now. Garters. That much I have. The violet pair I wore today. That's all he bought me out of the check he got on the first. Oh no, there was the face lotion I finished the last of yesterday that made my skin like new. I told him over and over again... Get that made up in the same place and don't forget it. God only knows whether he did after all I said to him. I'll know by the bottle anyway. If not, I suppose I'll only have to wash in my piss, like beef tea or chicken soup with some of that apopanax and violet. I thought it was beginning to look coarse or old a bit. The skin underneath is much finer where it peeled off there, on my finger, after the burn. It's a pity it isn't all like that. And the four paltry handkerchiefs, about six shilling in all. Sure, you can't get on in this world without style. All going in food and rent. When I get it, I'll lash it around, I tell you, in fine style. I always want to throw a handful of tea into the pot. Measuring and mincing. If I buy a pair of old brogues itself. Do you like those new shoes? Yes. How much were they? I've no clothes at all. The brown costume and the skirt and jacket and the one at the cleaners. Three. What's that for any woman? Cutting up this old hat and patching up the other. The men won't look at you and women try to walk on you because they know you've no man. Then with all the things getting dearer every day, for the four years more I have of life, up to 35, no, I'm... What am I at all? I'll be 33 in September. Will I? What? Ah, well. Look at that Mrs Galbraith. She's much older than me. I saw her when I was out last week. Her beauty's on the wane. 
She was a lovely woman. Magnificent head of hair on her. Down to her waist. Tossing it back like that. Like Kitty O'Shea in Grantham Street. First thing I did every morning. To look across, see her comb in it. As if she loved it and was full of it. Pity I only got to know her the day before we left. And that Mrs Langtree, the Jersey Lily the Prince of Wales was in love with. I suppose he's like the first man, going the roads only for the name of a king. They're all made the one way. Only a black man's I'd like to try. A beauty up to, what was she? Forty-five. There was some funny story about the jealous old husband. What was it at all? And an oyster knife. He went, no. He made her wear a kind of a tin thing round her. And the Prince of Wales, yes, he had the oyster knife. Can't be true, a thing like that. Like some of those books he brings me. The works of Master Francois somebody. Supposed to be a priest. About a child born out of her ear because her bum gush fell out. A nice word for any priest to write. And her A-E. As if any fool wouldn't know what that meant. I hate that pretending of all things. With that old blackguard's face on him. Anybody can see it's not true. And that ruby and fair tyrants. He brought me that twice. I remember when I came to page 50. The part about where she hangs him up out of a hook with a cord. Flagellate. Sure, there's nothing for a woman in that. All invention made up. About he drinking the champagne out of her slipper after the ball was over. Like the infant Jesus in the crib at Inchicori in the Blessed Virgin's arms. Sure, no woman could have a child that big taken out of her. And I thought first it came out of her side. Because how could she go to the chamber when she wanted to... And she a rich lady. Of course she felt honoured. His Royal Highness, he was in Gibraltar the year I was born. I bet he found lilies there too where he planted the tree. He planted more than that in his time. He might have planted me too if he'd come a bit sooner. Then I wouldn't be here as I am. He ought to chuck that freeman with the paltry few shillings he knocks out of it and go into an office or something where he'd get regular pay, or a bank where they could put him up on a throne to count the money all the day. Of course he prefers plottering about the house, so you can't stir with him any side. What's your programme today? I wish he'd even smoke a pipe like father to get the smell of a man, or pretending to be mooching about for advertisements, when he could have been in Mr Cuff's still only for what he did then. Sending me to try and patch it up. I could have got him promoted there to be the manager. He gave me a great marada once or twice. First he was as stiff as the mischief. Really and truly, Mrs Bloom. Only I felt rotten simply with the old rubbishy dress that I lost the leads out of. The tails with no cut in it. But they're coming into fashion again. I bought it simply to please him. I knew it was no good by the finish. Pity I changed my mind of going to Todd and Burns, as I said, and not Lee's. It was just like the shop itself. Rummage sale. A lot of trash. I hate those rich shops. Get on your nerves. Nothing kills me altogether. Only he thinks he knows a great lot about a woman's dress and cooking, mattering everything he can scour off the shelves into it. If I went by his advice as every blessed hat I put on, does that suit me? Yes, take that. That's all right. The one like a wedding cake, standing up miles off my head, he said suited me. Or the dish cover one coming down on my backside. On pins and needles about the shop girl in that place in Grafton Street, I had the misfortune to bring him into. And she as insolent as ever she could be with her smirk saying, I'm afraid we're giving you too much trouble. What's she there for? But I stared it out of her. Yes, he was awfully stiff, and no wonder. But he changed the second time he looked, poldy, pig-headed as usual, like the soup. 
but I could see him looking very hard at my chest when he stood up to open the door for me. It was nice of him to show me out in any case. I'm extremely sorry, Mrs. Bloom, believe me. Without making it too marked the first time, after him being insulted and me being supposed to be his wife, I just half smiled. I know my chest was out that way at the door when he said, I'm extremely sorry. And I'm sure you were. <laughs> yes, I think he made them a bit firmer, sucking them like that so long. He made me thirsty. Titties, he calls them. I had to laugh. Yes, this one anyhow. Stiff the nipple gets for the least thing. I'll get him to keep that up. And I'll take those eggs, beaten up with Marsala. Fatten them out for him. <laughs> what are all those veins and things? Curious the way it's made. Two the same in case of twins. They're supposed to represent beauty, placed up there, like those statues in the museum, one of them pretending to hide it with her hand. Aren't they so beautiful? Of course, compared with what a man looks like, with his two bags full and his other thing hanging down out of him, or sticking up at you, like a hat rack. No wonder they hide it with a cabbage leaf. That disgusting Cameron Highlander behind the meat market, or that other wretch with the red head behind the tree, where the statue of the fish used to be, when I was passing, pretending he was pissing, standing out for me to see it with his babby clothes up to one side, the Queen's own. They were a nice lot. It's well the Surreys relieved them. They're always trying to show it to you. Every time nearly... I passed outside the men's greenhouse near the Harcourt Street station, just to try. Some fella or other trying to catch my eye, as if it was one of the seven wonders of the world. Oh, and the stink of those rotten places. The night coming home with Pauldy after the Comerford's party. Oranges and lemonade to make you feel nice and watery. I went into one of them. It was so biting cold, I couldn't keep it. When was that? Ninety-three. The canal was frozen. Yes, it was a few months after. A pity a couple of the Camerons weren't there to see me. Squatting in the men's place. Mia the Rue. I tried to draw a picture of it before I tore it up, like a sausage or something. I wonder... They're not afraid going about of getting a kick or a bang of something there. The woman is beauty, of course. That's admitted. When he said I could pose for a picture naked to some rich fella in Hollow Street when he lost the job in Healy's and I was selling the clothes and strumming in the coffee palace, would I be like that bath of the nymph with my hair down? Yes. Yeah. Only she's younger. Or I'm a little like that dirty bitch in the Spanish photo he has. Nymphs. You stay go about like that. I asked him about her. And that word met something with hoses in it. And he came out with some jawbreakers about the incarnation. He never can explain a thing simply the way a body can understand. Then he goes and burns the bottom out of the pan, all for his kidney. This one not so much. There's the mark of his teeth still, where he tried to bite the nipple. I had to scream out. Aren't they fearful trying to hurt you? I had a great breast of milk with Millie. Enough for two. What was the reason of that? He said I could have got a pound a week as a wet nurse. All swelled out the morn and that delicate-looking student that stopped in number 28 with the citrons. Penrose nearly caught me washing through the window, only for I snapped up the towel to my face. That was his studenting. Hurt me, they used to, weaning her. Till he got Dr Brady to give me the Belladonna prescription, I had to get him to suck them, they were so hard. He said it was sweeter and thicker than cows. 
Then he wanted to milk me into the tea. Well, he's beyond everything, I declare. Somebody ought to put him in the budget. If I only could remember the one half of the things and write a book out of it. The works of Master Poldy. Yes, and it's so much smoother, this skin. Much. An hour he was at them, I'm sure, by the clock. Like some kind of a big infant I had at me. They want everything in their mouth. All the pleasure those men get out of a woman. I can feel his mouth. Oh, Lord, I must stretch myself. I wished he was here, or somebody, to let myself go with and come again like that. I feel all fire inside me. Or if I could dream it, when he made me spend the second time tickling me behind with his finger, I was coming for about five minutes with my legs round him. I had to hug him after. Oh, Lord, I wanted to shout out all sorts of things, fuck or shit or anything at all, only not to look ugly. Or those lines from the strain. Who knows the way he'd take it? You want to feel your way with a man. They're not all like him, thank God. Some of them want you to be so nice about it. I notice the contrast. He does it and doesn't talk. I gave my eyes that look, with my hair a bit loose from the tumbling and my tongue between my lips up to him, the savage brute. Thursday, Friday, one Saturday, two Sunday, three. Oh, Lord, I can't wait till Monday. Free! Train somewhere. Whistling. The strength those engines have in them. Like big giants. And the water rolling all over and out of them, all sides. Like the end of Love's old sweet song. The poor men that have to be out all the night from their wives and families, in those roasting engines. Stifling it was today. I'm glad I burned the half of those old Freemans and photo bits. Leaving things like that lying about, he's getting very careless. And threw the rest of them up in the WC. I'll get him to cut them tomorrow for me. Instead of having them there for the next year to get a few pence for them, have him asking, where's last January's paper? And all those old overcoats I bundled out of the hall, making the place hotter than it is. That rain was lovely and refreshing just after my beauty sleep. I thought it was going to get like Gibraltar. My goodness, the heat there. Before the Levanter came on, black as night, and the glare of the rocks standing up in it, like a big giant compared with their three rock mountain they think is so great. With the red sentries here and there, the poplars, and they all white hot, and the smell of the rainwater in those tanks, watching the sun all the time, weltering down on you. Faded all that lovely frock father's friend Mrs. Stanhope sent me from the Bay Marche Paris. What a shame. My dearest Doggerina, she wrote on it. She was very nice. What's this her other name was? Just a PC to tell you I sent the little present. Have just had a jolly warm bath and feel a very clean dog now. Enjoyed it. Wagger. She called him Wagger. We'd give anything to be back in jib and hear you sing in old Madrid or waiting... Conconi is the name of those exercises. He bought me one of those new, some word I couldn't make out, shawls, amusing things, but tear for the least thing. Still they're lovely, I think, don't you? We'll always think of the lovely teas we had together, 
scrumptious currant scones and raspberry wafers I adore. Well now, dearest Dogarina, be sure and write soon. Kind. She left out regards to your father. Also Captain Grove. With love, yours affectionately, Hester. X, 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 X. She didn't look a bit married, just like a girl. He was years older than her. Wagger. He was awfully fond of me. When he held down the wire with his foot for me to step over at the bullfight at Lalania, when that matador Gomez was given the bull's ear, these clothes we have to wear, whoever invented them, expecting you to walk up Kalini Hill then, for example, at that picnic all stazed up, you can't do a blessed thing in them in a crowd, run or jump out of the way. That's why I was afraid when that other ferocious old bull began to charge the banderieros with the sashes and the two things in their hats and the brutes of men shouting, Bravo, Toro! Sure, the women were as bad in their nice white mantillas, ripping all the whole insides out of those poor horses. I never heard of such a thing in all my life. Yes, he used to break his heart at me. Taken off the dog, barking in Bell Lane. Poor brute, and it's sick. What became of them ever? <sighs> I suppose they're dead long ago, the two of them. It's like all through a mist. Makes you feel so old. I made the scones, of course. I had everything all to myself then. A girl. Hester. We used to compare our hair. Mine was thicker than hers. She showed me how to settle it at the back when I push it up. And what's this else? How to make a knot on a thread with the one hand. We were like cousins. What age was I then? The night of the storm, I slept in her bed. She had her arms round me. Then we were fighting in the morning with the pillow. <laughs> what fun. He was watching me whenever he got an opportunity at the band on the Alameda Esplanade when I was with Father and Captain Grove. I looked up at the church first and then at the windows, then down, and our eyes met. I felt something go through me like all needles. My eyes were dancing, I remember, after. When I looked at myself in the glass, hardly recognised myself, the change. He was attractive to a girl, in spite of his being a little bald. Intelligent-looking, disappointed and gay at the same time. He was like... Thomas, in the shadow of Ashley Diash. I had a splendid skin from the sun and the excitement like a rose. I didn't get a wink of sleep. It wouldn't have been nice on account of her, but I could have stopped it in time. She gave me the moonstone to read. That was the first I read of Wilkie Collins. East Lynn I read and the shadow of Ashley Diat, Mrs. Henry Wood, Henry Dunbar by that other woman I lent him afterwards, with Mulvey's photo in it, so as he see I wasn't without, and Lord Lighton, Eugene Aram, Molly Bond she gave me by Mrs. Hungerford on account of the name. I don't like books with a Molly in them, like that one he brought me about the one from Flanders, a whore, always shoplifting anything she could, cloth and stuff and yards of it. Oh, this blanket is too heavy on me. <sighs> That's better. I haven't even one decent nightdress. This thing gets all rolled under me. Besides him and his foolin'. better. 
I used to be weltering then in the heat. My shift, drenched with the sweat, stuck in the cheeks of my bottom on the chair when I stood up. They were so fattish and firm when I got up on the sofa cushions to see, with my clothes up, and the bugs, tons of them at night, and the mosquito nets. I couldn't read a line. Lord, how long ago it seems. Centuries. Of course they never came back. And she didn't put her address right on it either. She may have noticed her wogger. People were always going away and we never... I remember that day with the waves and the boats with their high heads rocking and the smell of ship. Those officers' uniforms on shore leave made me seasick. He didn't say anything. He was very serious. I had the high button boots on and my skirt was blowing. She kissed me six or seven times. Didn't I cry? Yes, I believe I did, or near it. My lips were tatering when I said goodbye. She had a gorgeous wrap of some special kind of blue colour on her for the voyage, made very peculiarly to one side, like, and it was extremely pretty. It got as dull as the devil after they went. I was almost planning to run away mad out of it somewhere. We're never easy where we are. Father or aunt or marriage waiting always. Waiting to guide him to me. Waiting no speed his flying feet. Their damn guns bursting and booming all over the shop especially the Queen's birthday, and throwing everything down in all directions. If you didn't open the windows when General Ulysses Grant, whoever he was or did, supposed to be some great fella, landed off the ship, and old Sprague, the consul, that was there from before the flood, dressed up poor man, and he in mourning for the sun. Then the same old bugles for reveille in the morning and drums rolling and the unfortunate poor devils of soldiers walking about with mess tins smelling the place more than the old long-bearded Jews in their jelly bees and Levites assembly and sound clear and gunfire for the men to cross the lines and the warden marching with his keys to lock the gates and the bagpipes and only Captain Groves and Father talking about Rourke's Drift and Plevna and Sir Garnet Wolseley and Gordon at Khartoum lighting their pipes for them every time they went out. Drunken old devil with his grog on the windowsill. Catch him leaving any of it, picking his nose, trying to think of some other dirty story to tell up in a corner. But he never forgot himself when I was there. Sending me out of the room on some blind excuse, paying his compliments. The Bush Mills whiskey talking, of course. But he'd do the same to the next woman that came along. I suppose he died of gallop and drink ages ago. The days like years, not a letter from a living soul, except the odd few I posted to myself with bits of paper in them, so bored sometimes I could fight with my nails. Listening to that old Arab with the one eye and his hia of an instrument singing his hia, hia, hia. All my compliments on your hotchkapotch of your hias. As bad as now, with the hands hanging off me, looking out of the window. If there was a nice fella even, in the opposite house, that medical in Holler Street the nurse was after, when I put on my gloves and hat at the window to show I was going out. Not a notion what I meant. Aren't they thick? Never understand what you say, even. You'd want to print it up on a big poster for them, not even if you shake hands twice with the left. He didn't recognise me either, when I half frowned at him outside Westland Road Chapel. 
Where does their great intelligence come in, I'd like to know? Grey matter. They have it all in their tail, if you ask me. Those country gougers up in the city arms. Intelligence. They had a damn sight less than the bulls and cows they were selling. The meat and the coal man's bell. That noisy bugger trying to swindle me with the wrong bill he took out of his hat. What a pair of paws and pots and pans and kettles to mend. Any broken bottles for a poor man today? And no visitors or post ever, except his checks or some advertisement. Like that wonder worker they sent him addressed, Dear Madam, only his letter and the card from Millie this morning. See, she wrote a letter to him. Who did I get the last letter from? Oh, Mrs. Duen. Now what possessed her to write from Canada after so many years to know the recipe I had for Pisto Madrileno? Flowey Dillon. Since she wrote to say she was married to a very rich architect, if I'm to believe all I hear, with a villa and eight rooms. Her father was an awfully nice man. He was near seventy, always good-humoured. Well, now, Miss Tweedy or Miss Gillespie, there's the piano. That was a solid silver coffee service he had, too, on the mahogany sideboard. Then dying so far away. I hate people that have always their poor story to tell. Everybody has their own troubles. That poor Nancy Blake died a month ago of acute pneumonia. Well, I didn't know her so well as all that. She was Floey's friend more than mine. Poor Nancy. It's a bother having to answer. He always tells me the wrong things and no stops to say, like making a speech. Your sad bereavement. Sympathy. I always make that mistake and nephew with two W's in. I hope he'll write me a longer letter the next time. If it's a thing he really likes me. Oh, thanks be to the great God. I got somebody to give me what I badly wanted, to put some heart up into me. You've no chances at all in this place, like you used long ago. I wish somebody would write me a love letter. His wasn't much, and I told him he could write what he liked. Yours ever, Hugh Boylan. In old Madrid. Stuff silly women believe. Love is sighing, I am dying. Still, if he wrote it, I suppose there'd be some truth in it. True or no, it fills up your whole day in life. Always something to think about every moment. And see it all around you like a new world. I could write the answer in bed. To let him imagine me. Short, just a few words. Not those long, cross letters Atty Dillon used to write to the fella that was something in the four courts that jilted her after, out of the lady's letter writer, when I told her to say a few simple words he could twist how he liked. Not acting with precipi precipitancy, with equal candour, the greatest earthly happiness, answer to a gentleman's proposal affirmatively, my goodness, there's nothing else. It's all very fine for them. But as for being a woman, as soon as you're old, they might as well throw you out in the bottom of the ash pit. Mulvey's was the first. When I was in bed that morning, and Mrs Rubio brought it in with the coffee, she stood there. Stand, and when I asked her to hand me, and I pointing at them, I couldn't think of the word. A hairpin to open it with. A horquilla. Disobliging old thing. And it's staring her in the face, with her switch of false hair on her, and vain about her appearance. Ugly as she was, near eighty or a hundred, her face a mass of wrinkles.
with all her religion, domineering because she could never get over the Atlantic fleet coming in, half the ships of the world, and the Union Jack flying with all her carabineros, because four drunken English sailors took all the rock from them, because I didn't run into Mass often enough in Santa Maria to please her, with her shawl up on her, except when there was a marriage on with all her miracles of the saints and her black blessed virgin with the silver dress and the sun dancing three times on Easter Sunday morning and when the priest was going by with the bell, bringing the Vatican to the dying, blessing herself for his majesty. An admirer, he signed it. I near jumped out of my skin. I wanted to pick him up when I saw him following me along the Calle Royale in the shop window. Then he tipped me just in passing. But I never thought he'd write making an appointment. I had it inside my petticoat bodice all day, reading it up in every hole and corner while Father was up at the drill, instructing to find out by the handwriting or the language of stamps, singing... I remember. Shall I wear a white rose? And I wanted to put on the old stupid clock to near the time. He was the first man kissed me. Under the Moorish wall. My sweetheart when a boy. It never entered my head what kissing meant. Till he put his tongue in my mouth. His mouth was sweet like. Young, I put my knee up to him a few times to learn the way. What did I tell him I was engaged for? For fun, to the son of a Spanish nobleman named Don Miguel de la Flora. (laughs) And he believed me that I was to be married to him in three years' time. There's many a true word spoken in jest. There is a flower that bloometh. A few things I told him true about myself, just for him to be imagining. The Spanish girls he didn't like. I suppose one of them wouldn't have him. I got him excited. He crushed all the flowers on my bosom he brought me. He couldn't count the pesetas and the perigordas till I taught him. Capoquin he came from, he said, on the black water but it was too short. Then the day before he left, May, yes, it was May, when the infant king of Spain was born. I'm always like that in the spring. I'd like a new fella every year, up on the tip-top under the rock on Nero Harris Tower. I told him it was struck by lightning and all about the old Barbary apes they sent to clap him without a tail, careering all over the show on each other's back, Mrs. Rubio said. She was a regular old rock scorpion, robbing the chickens out of Inca's farm and throw stones at you if you went in here. He was looking at me. I had that white blouse on, open in the front to encourage him as much as I could, without too openly. They were just beginning to be plump. I said I was tired. We lay over the fir tree cove, a wild place. I suppose it must be the highest rock in existence, the galleries and casemates and those frightful rocks and St. Michael's Cave with the icicles or whatever they call them hanging down and ladders, all the mud plotching my boots. I'm sure that's the way down the monkeys go under the sea to Africa when they die. The ships out far like chips. That was the Malta boat passing. Yes, the sea and the sky. You could do what you liked. Lie there forever. He caressed them outside. They love doing that. It's the roundness there. I was leaning over him with my white rice straw hat to take the newness out of it. The left side of my face, the best. My blouse open for his last day. Transparent kind of shirt he had. 
I could see his chest pink. He wanted to touch mine with his for a moment, but I wouldn't let him. He was awfully put out. First for fear, you never know, consumption, or leave me with a child, embarrassada. That old servant Inez told me that one drop even, if it got into you at all, after I tried with the banana, <laughs> but I was afraid it might break and get lost up in me somewhere, because they once took something down out of a woman that was up there for years, covered with lime salts. They're all mad to get in there where they came out of. You'd think they could never go far enough up, and then they're done with you, in a way, till the next time. Yes, because there's a wonderful feeling there, so tender all the time. How did we finish it off? Yes. Oh, yes, I pulled him off into my handkerchief, pretending not to be excited, but I opened my legs. I wouldn't let him touch me inside my petticoat, because I had a skirt opening up the side. I tormented the life out of him, first tickling him. I loved Rouse and that dog in the hotel. A walk, walk, a walk. His eyes shut, and a bird flying below us. He was shy all the same. I liked him like that, moaning. I made him blush a little when I got over him that way, when I unbuttoned him and took his out and drew back the skin. It had a kind of eye in it. They're all buttons, men, down the middle on the wrong side of them. Molly darling, he called me. What was his name? Jack. Joe. Harry Mulvey, was it? Yes, I think. A lieutenant. He was rather fair. He had a laughing kind of voice. So I went round to the what-you-call-it. Everything was what-you-call-it. Moustache, had he? He said he'd come back. Lord, it's just like yesterday to me. And if I was married... He'd do it to me, and I promised him yes, faithfully. I'd let him block me now. Flying. Perhaps he's dead, or killed, or a captain, or admiral. It's nearly twenty years. If I said for a tree cove, he would. If he came up behind me and put his hands over my eyes to guess who, I might recognise him. He's young still, about 40 perhaps. He's married, some girl on the black water, and is quite changed. They all do. They haven't half the character a woman has. She little knows what I did with her beloved husband before he ever dreamt of her. In broad daylight too, in the sight of the whole world, you might say. They could have put an article about it in the Chronicle. I was a bit wild after. When I blew out the old bag the biscuits were in from Benedy Brothers and exploded it, Lord, what a bang! All the woodcocks and pigeons screaming. Coming back, the same way that we went. Over Middle Hill, round by the old guard house and the Jews' burial place, pretending to read out the Hebrew on them. I wanted to fire his pistol. He said he hadn't one. He didn't know what to make of me, with his pea cap on that he always wore crooked as often as I settled it straight. HMS Calypso, swinging my hat. That old bishop that spoke off the altar, his long preach about women's higher functions, about girls now riding the bicycle and wearing pea caps, and the new woman bloomers... God sent him sense and me more money. I suppose they're called after him. I never thought that would be my name. Bloom. When I used to write it in print to see how it looked on a visiting card or practising for the butcher. And oblige, M. Bloom. You're looking blooming, Josie used to say after I married him. Well, it's better than Breen, or Briggs does Brig, 
or those awful names with bottom in them. Mrs. Ram's bottom or some other kind of a bottom. Mulvey I wouldn't go mad about either. Or suppose I divorced him. Mrs. Boylan. <gasps> My mother, whoever she was, might have given me a nicer name, the Lord knows, after the lovely one she had. Lunita Laredo. The fun we had, running along Willis Road to Europa Point, twisting in and out all round the other side of Jersey. They were shaking and dancing about in my blouse like Millie's little ones now when she runs up the stairs. I loved looking down at them. I was jumping up at the pepper trees and the white poplars, pulling the leaves off and throwing them at him. He went to India. He was to write. The voyages those men have to make to the ends of the world and back. It's the least they might get. A squeeze or two at a woman while they can. Going out to be drowned or blown up somewhere. I went up Windmill Hill to the flats that Sunday morning with Captain Rubio's that was dead. Spyglass, like the sentry had. He said he'd have one or two from on board. I wore that frock from the Bay Marche Paris and the coral necklace, the straight shining. I could see over to Morocco almost, the Bay of Tangier white and the Atlas Mountain with snow on it and the straits like a river so clear. Harry, Molly darling. I was thinking of him on the sea all the time after, at mass, when my petticoat began to slip down at the elevation. Weeks and weeks I kept the handkerchief under my pillow for the smell of him. There was no decent perfume to be gotten at Gibraltar. Only that cheap peau d'Espagne that faded and left a stink in you more than anything else. I wanted to give him a memento. He gave me that clumsy clattering for luck that I gave Gardner going to South Africa, where those boars killed him with their war and fever. But they were well beaten all the same, as if it brought its bad luck with it, like an opal or a pearl. Still, it must have been pure sixteen-carat gold, because it was very heavy. But what could you get in a place like that? The sandfrog shower from Africa and that derelict ship that came up to the harbour, Marida. Marie, what you call it? No, he hadn't a moustache. That was Gardner. Yes, I can see his face. Clean shaven. Free! That train again. Weeping tone. Once in the dear dead... Days beyond recall. Close my eyes, breathe, my lips forward, kiss, sad look, eyes open, piano. Air o'er the world, the mist began. I hate that is big. Comes love, sweet, so. out full when I get in front of the footlights again. Kathleen Kearney and her lot of squealers. Miss this, miss that, miss the other. Lot of sparrow farts skitting around, talking about politics they know as much about as my backside. Anything in the world to make themselves some way interesting. Irish homemade beauties. Soldier's daughter am I. I, and whose are you? Bootmakers and publicans. I beg your pardon, coach. I thought you were a wheelbarrow. They died down dead off their feet. If ever they got a chance of walking down the Alameda on an officer's arm like me, on the band night, my eyes flash, my bust that they haven't, passion, God help their poor head. I knew more about men in life when I was fifteen than they'll all know at fifty. They don't know how to sing a song like that. Gardner said, no man could look at my mouth and teeth smiling like that and not think of it. 
I was afraid he mightn't like my accent first. He's so English. All father left me in spite of his stamps. I've my mother's eyes and figure anyhow, he always said. They're so snotty about themselves, some of those cads. He wasn't a bit like that. He was dead gone on my lips. Let them get a husband first that's fit to be looked at, and a daughter like mine, or see if they can excite a swell with money that can pick and choose whoever he wants, like Boylan, to do it four or five times, locked in each other's arms. Or the voice either. I could have been a prima donna, only I married him. Comes love's old Deep down, chin back, not too much, make it double. My lady's bower is too long for an encore. About the moated grange at twilight and vaunted rooms. Yes, I'll sing winds that blow from the south that he gave after the choir stairs performance. I'll change that lace on my black dress to show off my bubs. And I'll, yes, by God, I'll get that big fan mended, make them burst with envy. Oh, my hole is itching me. Always when I think of him, I feel I want to... I feel some wind in me. Better go easy, not wake him. Have him at it again, slobbering. After washing every bit of myself, back, belly and sides. If we had even a bath itself, or my own room. Anyway... I wish he'd sleep in some bed by himself with his cold feet on me. Give us room even to let a fart. God, or do the least thing. Better, yes. Hold him like that a bit on my side. Piano, quietly. Sweet. There's that train far away. Pianissimo. (sighs) One more. So, that was a relief. Wherever you be, let your wind go free. Who knows if that pork chop I took with my cup of tea after was quite good with the heat. I couldn't smell anything of it. I'm sure that queer-looking man in the pork butchers is a great rogue. I hope that lamp is not smoking. Fill my nose up with smuts. Better than having him leaving the gas on all night. I couldn't rest easy in my bed in Gibraltar, even getting up to sea. Why am I so damn nervous about that? Though I like it in the winter. It's more company.